Great. Thank you, Christine. Uh, quick introductions. I'm Adam Springwater, Senior Client Relations Manager for the HiSET program, and I'm joined with... Hi, I'm Tanya Haug. I'm the National Director for the HiSET program. Wonderful, and we're excited to be here with you today. Um, I'm going to be presenting the slides. Uh, Tanya is going to be monitoring the chat, and we're going to do a presentation that's an introduction to the HiSET itself. Uh, and we welcome questions. We uh, Please enter your questions in the chat. And Tanya and I will do our best to answer them in real time, or if not, with a little bit of time that we have at the conclusion of this webinar. So let's get started. Welcome, Minnesota. Uh, from, from the top of the state uh, to the bottom, we welcome you. Uh, very uh, Quite a few friends across the state of Minnesota, and they're all excited that we're presenting to you today. So hello, Duluth. Hello, Grand Marais. Hello, Twin Cities. So let's get started. Uh, so, the HiSET uh, program uh, provides uh, a, let's see, I've got to move so I can see my screen better. Uh, HiSET program has a top-notch customer service uh, provided in, in four distinct areas. Uh, the, the main one that test takers use. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to present slides that prevent an introduction and an overview of how the HiSET program works and how we envision it working in the state of Minnesota. Our, our job is to make sure that the next 45 minutes are useful to you, and you will be provided with a PDF of all the slides we're using, so take notes if you want, but this is going to be a resource deck for you going forward. So one of the first things that's important to know is who to ask for help and who helps what. So test taker services is what it sounds like. It's for the test takers themselves. Uh, it's a 185-MIND-HISET or direct email HISET at ETS.org. Disability services, we're going to go into this quite a few slides about accommodations uh, and uh, getting accommodations through disability services for students that you may think might need an accommodation of some kind. Test administration services or TAS is the one that most of you, for those of you that are teachers or instructors, you'll deal with test taker services and disability services most often. But for test administrators and chief examiners, people actually administering the tests. Uh, Test Administration Services is our wonderful team that does all of the heavy lifting for you. Uh, and then last and certainly not least is HiSET Technical Support. Uh, and they help provide interface, you know, software problems, especially for the computer-based testing. So as I mentioned, uh, it's important to focus on TAS because they do the heavy lifting. Uh, so TAS, especially for chief administrators, uh, for HiSET testing staff of any kind, they're who you go to when you're not sure who to contact, if you have emergencies prior to or on the test day, if you want a clarification of test administration procedures, if there's been changes in your test center staffing. And also importantly, uh, you as the chief examiners have 100% control over the scheduling at each of your sites. And you do that through your portal, but TAS can certainly assist you with, with uh, things like that. Um, accessing the HiSET is easily done through our HiSET.ets.org website. Uh, there are three main, the, there's the main portal and then there's a hallway that takes you to four test takers. So if a test taker is curious about the HiSET, this is where you direct them to the four test takers. That's a link. Uh, you as test center administrators and educators would most like, most of you will be going through the four test centers and educators link. There is a link for your state directors and policymakers. And very importantly, if you do instruct in Spanish or need materials in Spanish, clicking on the En Español link seamlessly translates the entire page into Spanish and updates all the link. But for, for, for those of us that are attending the webinar today, this center link is the main one that you're going to be entering and then going to. Um, every person who tests on the HiSET must have a My HiSET account. This is an easy thing to set up. Once they've created the username as an email address, password is unique to each, each test taker. They can sign in, uh, but new users just click on create an account. When you create an account, it's really critical that three pieces of information be absolutely accurate, that they match what is on the ID that the test taker is going to present on test day. And that is first name, last name, and date of birth. Those have to match uh, perfectly. And through the testing uh, HiSET account, so it's an interesting thing with the HiSET. <clears throat> the student actually has ownership over their scores. So uh, as the HiSET launches in, in Minnesota, you may have students moving to Minnesota from, let's say, Indiana or Colorado 
or New Mexico or wherever it is that they're moving from, and they may have already started the high set uh, previously, their accounts and their scores move with them. They stay with them wherever they go. Conversely, if you have a student who's uh, started in Minnesota and whose life uh, takes them, let's say, to New Jersey or to California, uh, they can continue to access their scores and continue their high set progress by accessing uh, their file. But the main thing they use their, their file for is to manage and schedule appointments and to view these high set score reports. Now, I've been an educator. Uh, we're going to take a look at those score reports. I've been an educator for the better part of 30 years, and I think you'll be as excited as I was when I first saw the score reports. They're very easy to read. A great page to go to. So there's the high set main web page that we've looked at. Uh, and then there's another page that I strongly recommend you take a look at, uh, and your students do as well. And you can Google, by the way, these titles are, are Google search searchable uh, word groups. So if you Google high set state requirements, you will come to this page, although we're going to provide you with the link. And you can open up states. And now when Minnesota is launched, it will have its own state. But you can find a tr tremendous amount of information about questions, frequently asked questions that have to do with the specific state or jurisdiction. Um, you can also, there's a powerful search tool on this page to find an adult education center, that's for test prep, or a test center. Uh, and these are searchable links that, so if you search, uh, it will provide you with uh, all of the adult education programs that are listed in our, in our, pool, in our database. By the way, we, we're going to update that with your state director, but if when you look at this database, you're not there, just email us and we'll have you add it. Uh, and so test takers can find uh, adult education programs in their area. The same thing is true for a test center. Uh, and keep in mind that you can constrain it by city, state, zip code. Uh, you can, the distance, this is adjustable 5, 10, 15, 25, 50, or even 100 miles. And you can constrain by test uh, delivery methods. So it's a very powerful search engine for finding out what's in your area. Or for instance, if you had a student that was moving from, let's say, uh, Fargo to Minneapolis, and you wanted to help them find testing centers in Minneapolis, they could do a search this way. It's a very powerful tool. But some of the other frequently asked questions that are on the page, and this is why I, I really recommend not only you taking a look at it, but having your students, your test takers do it as well. It answers questions like how much does it cost, fees, payments, and refunds, testing options, what are the options available, in, and this will be state specific, how to schedule an appointment, what do I do on the test day? Uh, and then scores. How do I know if I've passed the high set exam? And, and of course, and other frequently asked questions that, that are uh, uh, on this page. So it's a very wonderful resource and provides a lot of information. Again, uh, high set state requirements is the search. Now, the high set itself, it's important to understand what is the high set itself so that we can take a look at that uh, together. Uh, so just some of you probably already know this, but just to make sure we're building a foundation strongly with all of us understanding, um, there are five subtests that make up what we call a battery or the complete high set. In order to pass the high set, you must take and pass all five of the subtests. There are between 50 and 61 questions on each of the subtests, and all of the multiple choice questions are a single response multiple choice format, a very familiar format that helps lower student anxiety and stress about the test. They know that every question is going to be a question with four to five choices for answers. The one exception is the written portion of the subtest, that, which has an essay. And that's a two-part, the 61 questions. And we're going to take a closer look at that because that has a slightly different scoring uh, parameter. So to pass a subtest, Remember, we said there's between 50 and 61 questions on each of the subtests. Each subtest, here's a little math proportion problem for you, first thing in the morning for some of us. Uh, it's scaled on a 20-point scale. So in order to pass an individual, now there are, there are three criteria. Uh, the first is that you have to score at least an 8 out of 20 on each subtest, roughly 40% in order to pass. On the written subtest, keep in mind that there are to two parts. There's the essay and the multiple choice. So although together they are worth 20 points, the multiple choice is worth 14 and the essay is worth six, at least two of those eight points must come from the essay. So go figure. In order to pass the written subtest, you must pass the essay portion as well. 
Now, the last thing to pay attention to is that you must achieve a total score of at least 45 points. And if you do some quick math and there's five subtests, eight times five is only 40, which means it's important for the test taker and for the instructors to know the test takers must score higher than the minimum passing on at least one of the subtests. Now, one of the very exciting things about the HiSET is that we offer a college and career readiness score. And a student scoring 15 or above on a subtest, or at least a four on the uh, essay and the written subtest, gets a CCR readiness indicator. And many community colleges will play, well, it's, it's, it's a way for them to avoid having to take you know, non-credit bearing courses or ACCUPLACE or COMPASS type placement tests. It allows most students to go into credit bearing courses in two and four year secondary institutions. So just to recap, between 50 and 61 questions on each subject, there's five of them. You need to score at least, and they're scaled to a 20 point scale. You need to score at least eight out of 20 on each subtest. You have to have at least a two out of those eight points uh, from the essay on the written portion. And the total must be at least 45. So you have to do better than the minimum on at least one, if not all, of the subtests. The high set is available in computer based, primarily in Minnesota, be computer based. We do have a paper based format. It's available as an accommodation only. We'll talk a little bit about accommodations later uh, in our disabilities uh, accommodation section. The test is available in English or in Spanish. And we do have accommodated test forms. In addition to paper based, we have other accommodations uh, that we provide. Keep in mind the test must be taken at an official high test, high set test center. And again, check that high set state requirements for test eligibility. So I got excited before about this. I want to circle back to these reports and credentials because uh, especially for those of us that have been in education for more than 10 minutes, you all know that report that's impossible to figure out. And really the main question that students and administrators and educators are always asking is, did I pass? That's, that's the number one question. So let's take a look at the individual subtest score report and the comprehensive score report. And let's ask ourselves if that question is asked, answered completely and succinctly for the student. So this is the individual test report. There's gonna be one of these generated for each of the five subtests. Keep in mind that if you look right there, did you achieve the minimum score? Yes or no? And there it is very clearly, yes. But then it breaks it down. Now I chose the written subtest because it has that caveat of you need to have at least two of the points coming from the essay. So if you look across, it says the subtest that, the, that we're looking at, the written, the score was 15 out of 20, minimum was eight, and yes, they achieved the minimum score. On the essay, they got a two out of possible six, minimum is two, and so yes, they achieved it. So did you meet the minimum requirements of language arts written subtest? Yes, simple language. What I enjoy even more as an educator is that it breaks down the performance summary so that it's especially important if the student didn't pass, so it'll let them know which of the content categories the student needs to focus on. But even though this student did pass, it's highly likely they're gonna be going on to a two year or, or some kind of secondary program. And we could tell the student, hey, it's great that you passed. Uh, you did well in organizational ideas and language facility, but let's let's pay attention to writing conventions as you move forward. So very informative, but answers that basic question. Same thing is true of the comprehensive score report. Now this is for a student who's either trying to figure out if they've taken all five or what they still need to take, but more importantly, did you pass? And there it is, smack dab in the middle of the page. Did you pass the high set exam? Yes or no? And if you look above it, there's a, a cascade in programming terms, there's a cascade of, of, of qualifiers here that are the ones that I mentioned earlier. Um, have you taken, first off, have you taken all five of the, of the subtests? Yes or no? Did you meet all three of the high, high set scoring criteria? Score at least eight out of 20 on all high set subtests. Score at least two out of six on the essay. Achieve a total score on the high set subtests of at least 45. And then it gives them their total score right there. Again, as with the individual test, it breaks it down. Now, students may have taken subtests more than once. We're interested in their highest score. There's no penalty for retaking the high test, high set. Subtest, if you score lower, we still keep your highest score. Sometimes students will try to achieve that CCR, that Crowledge and Career Readiness Indicator. They've passed, they want to take it again and see if they can do a little bit better. There's no they don't get uh, dinged for doing that. We list their highest score when they took it and whether or not they passed. Now, so that's 
a little bit about the test itself and what breaks it down. Uh, Tanya, I'm going to pause. Are there any questions we should address right now or should I continue? Uh, no questions yet. Okay, perfect. So let's keep going. That's that's it. I'm glad that the, hopefully this is all working for you guys. Now, one of the best documents for me as an instructor was the HiSEC test of the lens. Again, I encourage you, we're going to send you the links. They're right here. These are clickable links. But you're certainly welcome to Google I said test at a glance. And it answers what I love. It's the three big questions. What's on the test? Content categories. How it's assessed? The process categories. And why it's assessed? The college and career readiness standards descriptors. So I have yet to find a student who's not interested in what's on the test and how it's assessed. Sometimes they're a little vague on why it's there, but they, they do generally care about that. And I have, and, and all instructors that I've worked with and, and administrators care about these three questions. So let's take a look at how the high school tested grants not only answers these questions, but presents them in a way that is readily accessible to both the teacher, the administrator, and the student. So let's take a look at reading. So we can see this is the reading test. We're reminded of the time given for the test. Oh, that's right. This is the one with 50 questions. Oh, yes, they're all that single response multiple choice question format. I was told about that. It's going to be a simple question and answer format. I don't have to worry about dragging or dropping or ordering. This is just be a simple question format. And now I can look at the content categories and I can see that the vast majority of the questions are going to be about informational text. Well, that makes sense. I'm an adult learner in an adult situation. And pretty much after I got out of, junior, out of the junior high school level, the instructional uh, informational test, instructional, uh, what they call it, uh, not non-literature or entertainment, is what we focus on. Uh, and then I can look at the process categories. And then if I actually looked at the high set test at a glance, it would break those down even more detail, showing what those process categories are, how they're, each one of them is going to be assessed so that I can properly prepare and it actually drills it even more deeper to give specific content categories. Let's take a look at the written portion. Written portion, again, the written, uh, we're, we're going to see that's the writing. I see the time is, is two hours. It's got 61 questions. Okay. The multi, there is that single response, multiple choice question, but there is that essay question. This is how the content uh, categories are going to be assessed for both the multiple choice and the essay question. I can clearly see that language facility is the major focus. And I know that I need roughly 40% of this test to pass. So although organization ideas and writing conventions are important, clearly as an instructor, we're gonna to wanna to focus on language facility. And as a student, I gotta make sure that that's what I'm ready for. But we do more than that, I said. We actually provide you, because many people look at these and say, well, what does an actual passing essay look like? So we not only provide scoring response guides that give you the actual rubric that is used, it's the one that we use, so there's no mystery there. It's fully transparent of the scores from one to six in English and in Spanish. But we also provide you with actual scored written responses so that a student and an instructor can see exactly what, not only what is the rubric, but what is passing. So here's an example of what that rubric looks like. It's presented a couple of different ways. This is a linear one, but there are there is is presented as a grid. So you can see what a one, two, three, and four are. This is an actual, we give a sample of what an actual uh, test question would be. This is one about dress code. So you can see the two essays. They're always paired essays with an argumentative. You, you take one side of it. It's an argumentative essay or uh, and, and you, you, you paired essays and you take a position one or the other. And then we show you exactly what a score is. So here's the essay right here. This is a passing essay on a score of two. And then the scoring guide will say exactly why this one passed or what it needed to do. And then you can look at all of the scores one through six and see what is passing and why it's passing. Critical information for an instructor. Science. Uh, I enjoyed science quite a bit. Uh, and uh, the science section I, I really find powerful because um, uh, although I did spend quite a bit of my life in the Midwest, uh, as I mentioned before, I had quite a few friends in Minnesota. I, I spent five years going to school in Iowa and living in and around uh, in the, Indiana in the Midwest and canoeing on some of your beautiful lakes up in northern Minnesota. Uh, science is important to me. I live in California now. Uh, I could tell you that earth science and tectonic plates and earthquakes, that's critical information for me. I enjoy that stuff. Physical science, uh, I like science and chemistry, you know, physical science. But if I'm preparing the student 
to take and pass the HISET or any HSE exam, it's clear to me that practically half the test is life sciences. So a student looking at this can say, well, it's an 80 minute test. There's 60 of those multiple choice questions. And I'm gonna make sure that I focused on life science. But more importantly, the test at a glance also provides the actual content category so you can break it down and see what exactly, so which chapters in the book do I need to know in life science? And if you look at number four here, it's a little hard to read, but it, it well, one, these, these uh, one, two, three, and four break down specifically what aspects of life science are going to be tested so that I know what to focus on and more importantly, what I don't need to focus on as I prepare to take the science uh, subtest. Same thing is true with social studies. Again, number of minutes, there's 60 questions, multiple choice, I got all that. Um, I happen to enjoy geography. Personally, many of my students enjoy geography. Economics is an area that we all, especially in adult education programs, most adult learners are working or, or thinking about work, that these are all things that they care a lot about. But if we're gonna prepare them to prepare, pr prepare them to pass this high set exam, the focus needs to be on history and civics and government. And more importantly, if you look at the, uh, the content categories, you can see not only does it tell you which parts of history, but if you look at number three, it's a little hard to read, but it breaks down basically the 10 chapters of the book you need to focus on. River Valley civilizations, classic civilizations, age of exploration, and so forth. Same thing true of government. So it really helps drill into the students what's on the test, how it's assessed, and why it's there. Math, we save the best for last. Math uh, is causes generally the most anxiety. Well, math and the essay, but math generally causes a lot of anxiety. Uh, and again, this will help empower the students and the instructors to prepare them to take and pass it the first time. If you take a look, you can see that it's that same multiple choice format. Uh, but if you look at the content categories, you're gonna see again, that what is the area that, that we really need to focus on. Not surprising, it's algebraic concepts. So for those of you that instruct in math, if you're not sure what you're, in fact, even if you are sure what your math lesson is, but if you're not sure, I can tell you it's daily practice on orders of operation and on fractions, decimals, percents, and exponents. In fact, if you're doing a reading program, you should do daily practice on order of operations, fractions, decimals, percents, and exponents, because those are the two areas of linear algebra that cause the most stumbling blocks. And if people are strong in those areas, the algebraic concepts is, is, is practically half the test. But again, the content categories will break it down for you and break it down specifically what you need to study beyond just those two basic things. And I thought I'd give you a, a little peek of what that career and college ready standards pages look like. Now, these are the actual standards, so they will need some interpretation. But for you as instructors, it will help you guide, look at the programs that you're using. And one of the great things about the test at a glance is it shows you that Whatever instruction materials you're currently using will be fully applicable and valuable in the preparation of, of for students taking the high set. And the test at a glance helps guide you through those materials that you're already using to make sure that they're even more dialed into what the student needs. Now, math gets a lot of questions, so we're going to focus on that for a couple of slides. Uh, it's single response, multiple choice, no gridded responses, no drag and drop. It's calculator neutral. So although testers cannot provide their own calculator, one is provided for them in the computer-based CBT stands for computer-based testing, computer-based test package. And the test center can also provide a handheld calculator. Our high set requires that it just be basic or function or scientific, no memory. Now, sometimes the states have more specifications than that. And so let's move on to an area where I want to make sure that we cover this because we're, we're, we're just at about the 27 minute mark here. I want to make sure that we cover testing accommodations. Um, I was the special ed coordinator at the last district I worked in and in all my years of teaching, my, the, the man who trained me a long time ago said, we're all special needs, we just don't all have IEPs. And I think many of you, that resonates with each of you, especially in adult ed, we get students who we believe needed accommodation and it can often be very challenging because many times the IEPs or the documentation is missing or never existed. Whatever the situation is, um, Disability Services works on a case-by-case -case basis with you to first help you determine if an accommodation should be uh, applied to the student, then help you qualify the student for that accommodation, and then actually 
notify the test center and provide the accommodation. I love this part. Provide the accom approved accommodations are provided at no additional cost to either test taker or test center. So let's take a look at the process. We provided you with links to make this easy. So the first thing you do is review the HiSec test center test taker bulletin uh, and the website. If you think that a student, that'll give you some of the qualifiers, we can provide you with more detailed links in just a second. Uh, if you, you look at, at, at prop, uh, common accommodations, if, if you think a student might have an not, might need an accommodation, uh, reach out to High State Disability Services and they'll help you determine. If you and them together decides the accommodations form. We're going to show you what that looks like. Gather the documentation. Submit it as soon as possible. There may be something. The, 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 the rule of thumb is four to six weeks. My rule is if you think an accommodation might be needed right away, I don't care if the test is months out. And then if approved, the applicants receive an accommodation letter with the registration instructions. And then disability services not only manages the registration for the student, but again, provides all, all those accommodations at no additional cost to for what's approved. Well, as I've said several times, it's a case by case for some commonly recognized qualifiers. That's the that is, if you think a student needs an accommodation, check with the uh, testing list, check the accommodations list, and call disability or reach out to disability services. The most common one is extended time. Registering for accommodations once approved, those are scheduled directly through disability services. Uh, once that has happened, uh, test take those accommodations they can know that can be if there's a little bit of confusion it's like test takers and test takers don't understand that remember to schedule test takers with accommodation some accommodation services for support so these are, um, there's also uh, certain things that the test they can do themselves. Again, if you have a question, what should you do? do check the test taker bosses. They're happy to help you. Adam, can I? Form? Yes. Can I just stop you for a minute? You're breaking up a little bit. You might, might want to stop sharing your video. That might help. Uh, I will stop sharing my video. Hopefully that helps. Uh, I'm I'm on a high speed direct link, so I'm not sure where that is. Uh, is there anything that that I missed that I should go back over? We'll proceed and see how that goes. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, technology. No problem. Thank working. you, Adam. Uh, um, so the. Accommodations form, keep in mind, remember I said that when you create that form, the critical pieces of information are first name, last name, and date of birth. Well, here again, first name, last name, date of birth, and as they appear on the test taker's ID that they're going to present at time of testing, a key thing to notice is that it's pretty straightforward. They uh, communications, but you can apply for an accommodation easily for all five tests at once or check off the ones you're talking about what you'd like to test in, and then what the accommodations are. We also want to make this easy for you. So when you get this document, you'll get these links. The you can Google high set accommodation policies, and you can Google high set documentation guidelines, but here are the links as well. And they provide you with more details. Keep in mind, these are guidelines and policies. Your case will be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. So we're going to wrap up. We're in the last 12 minutes, and I want to leave some time for questions. So just going to give you just a quick uh, run through some of the many educator and test taker resources that are provided on the website. I like to think the website is a little bit like the Swiss Army knife. It's got so much in there. Sometimes you have to pull out all the plays just to find the nail. 
profile that you're looking for, but it's a plethora of resources, including tips and strategies for getting ready. That test at a glance, if you, you can Google high to test, high to study. Companion is a great tool to help support your, your test takers. <laughs> Many of these things are strategies that you use already. We have a test prep resources page with a pull down menu that has the study companion, those sample questions and sample scored uh, writing responses uh, and, and guides that, that I showed you earlier. We also have practice tests, uh, free practice tests. That's always a good price. Uh, we have uh, how to interpret the results uh, and, and many, many more resources there than I could list here. There is free test prep on the HiSET website. Again, those practice tests and sample questions, interactive practice tests. For those of you that are math instructors, Khan Academy, uh, we have a, uh, a filtered list, well, a pre pre, uh, what is a previewed list of math tutorials, videos, and exercises. Um, there is uh, an online bookseller, an official HiSET guide that's available in English and Spanish. It's very reasonable. I think it's Retails for $23, and I've seen it listed for as little as $10 or even $11 or $12. And it's a very substantial guide. I, I have it myself. Again, remember that everything that we offer is also available in Spanish for Spanish speakers through that, that uh, portal link on Espanol. You can toggle back and forth between Spanish and English. Um, we are partnered with Essential Education to provide an online practice test. Uh, it's the official online practice test. It's fully aligned. Purchased after Essential Education, you can contact uh, Dan Griffith, Dan at EssentialEd.com, or simply Google Essential Ed on the OPT online practice test. Uh, we provide a roadmap for instructors. This is again on that resources page, and you can see this is a graph version, a graph spreadsheet layout of that very public, that, that spinning page that showed you the, the subtest of the number of questions that led. So let's see if we have any questions at this time. Uh, Tanya and I are both committed to supporting edu uh, test administrators, test takers, and, and, and test takers themselves across the country. We understand the work you do is very important, and we're very happy to be part of this, this team. So at this point, Tanya, are there any questions in the chat that we want to take a look at? I'm going to take a look at the chat myself. Okay. Sure. So let's I'm yep. going to right through the chat questions, or Tanya, do you want to take that on first? Um, actually, the only one we have right now is that question about teachers making an account. So you can take that one. Sure. So, Jean, thanks for the question. So, um, and I'm going to go, I'm going to try to put my video back. Let me know if it breaks up again. Um, so, there are many teachers assist students at making the account. So certainly there is situations that in the corrections environment. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's usually the instructors, the students themselves are not making up because they don't have access to the internet. So teachers can create accounts for students, but keep in mind it is the student's account. Uh, and the student as they go forward from your program is, is going to uh, keep ownership over that account. Uh, Stacy asks, is there a lockout period if the student does not pass a test multiple times? That's an interesting question, Stacy, and I'll answer. HiSET has its policy, and the state of Minnesota will determine theirs. So HiSET, it's not so much a lockout or a cooling down period. Um, that's up to the individual states. Some states do have like a two-week or 30-day period cooling down period. Some do not. Minnesota will have to decide how it wants to handle that. Um, there is students, when they register for the test, uh, they can take any individual subtest, remember there are five of them, up to three times in a calendar year. So for example, Stacy, you're my student, you register for the math test, it's the month that we're just in the month of January, you register for it. You can attempt the math subtest three times in 2022. If you take and do not pass it, you'll have to wait for 2022. Three in order to take it the fourth. Well, that's the first time I've said 2023. Uh -huh. uh, so that's so you have to wait till 2023 in order to take it a fourth time. Now, I hope that answers your question. I don't know that the state of Minnesota is intending to create a cooling off period. Tony, do we know anything about that? I do not think that there is a waiting period to retest. Um, you do have to wait until the scores are officially in. Um, so that would be um, at least the, the baseline waiting period. Sure. And so thank you for reminding me that, Tony. So when you take the high set, 
the scores are uploaded, uploaded to our processing center or they're mailed in. The day they arrive by mail or the day they are uploaded, the first business day that they are received, uh, scores, multiple choice question scores are scored within three days and posted to the student's portal and also made available to administrators at the site. Uh, the written essays that gives up to five days. Once those scores are posted, official scores are posted, the student can reschedule to retest. Uh, and I see the time you posted the roadmap. So Gene asks, uh, is there a manager type account that teachers have so they can see student scores? Excellent question. Um, so there is not a management account that teachers can use, but chief examiners and test administrators at your test site can, and they do have access through, a, through a, their portal as well as through uh, a, a feature we have. We have a very, very robust reporting feature called Data Manager. And uh, soon after we launch in Minnesota, we'll be doing, I'm so excited, we'll do webinars uh, to help bring you up to speed of Data Manager. Stacy said, thank you. Are there other questions that people would like to ask at this time? We have uh, six more minutes. Okay. Matt asks, does the HiSET have practice exams in each of the subtest domains? Are they scored versus simply practice? If provided, does scoring similar GD offer a likely to pass score? Excellent question, Matt. So the answer is yes to everything. Uh, we have multiple versions of practice tests, at least four free versions, and then you could purchase uh, practice tests uh, in each of the five subtests. So there's at least 20 there. I'm going to do some quick math. We have a document, a correlation document called Did You Are You Ready? It's called, it's, it's literally called the Are You Ready document. Uh, and the Are You Ready document not only correlates, it correlates uh, somewhat ready, ready, uh, uh, proficiently ready, or, or uh, very ready or proficiently ready. So there's a continuum of how ready a student is, not just ready to take or not take. It's a very robust document and it's tailored to each of the subtests, each of the individual practice tests. Uh, and Tanya has posted it for you there. Thank you, Tanya. And let me just go back and make sure. And then, um, yes, so we, we do better than, uh, well, I'm biased. I've used the GED program. It's an excellent program. If you're using it now, um, that's great at Empower Students. Uh, the high set program is also a good choice. Take a look at both of them. I think you'll find that we do a little bit better than the likely to pass. Uh, but again, uh, so the simple answer is yes. Tanya posted the reference guide. Uh, Christine says, looking for us to start posting resources and adult, look for us to start posting resources and adults are hooked. So, so Christine is going to post resources, and one of those resources is going to be a PDF of all the slides we used today. And then Tanya posted the practice test results. Are you ready to take the exam? Great questions. We have five more minutes. Comments, observations, concerns. Happy to answer them now. Christine, is there something you'd like us to address that you think maybe didn't get addressed or some depth up? Oh. Um, I, I guess I missed this. And I think um, as far as the essay goes, is that computer scored or human scored? Oh, that's a very good question, Christine. So uh, currently they are human scored. Um, oh, that's a big difference. That's a huge thing. Uh, and currently the process that is that is scored is that a, uh, a live person scores the essay uh, and then a second person scores and the scores are compared if they are off by one point uh, a third person scores and they're all blind scores so they don't know if they're the first second or potentially third um, so that's currently the way they're scored yes that's good to know for for those of us who um who uh, remember the uh, GED 2002, that was how it was scored before the computer scored um, tests, essays of the 2014 series. So that is a change back again. Thank you for that information. Yeah, and, and, and one of the things that, that, that is different, there's a lot, so like I said, I've, I've taught, I taught the GED for years. It's an excellent tool. There's nothing wrong with it. There are some fundamental differences between GED and HiSET. And I would encourage each of you to look at your students and ask yourself, which tool is going to best meet my programmatic goals? And as well as, and those should, and they do, I'm sure, include your students' goals. Um, one of the, the, the key factors that I liked about the high set is that I mentioned before, is that in order to pass the written subtest, you actually have to write an essay. Uh, and and that, that I, I find that the essay parameters are very important. And Kel, Christine and I talked 
this. Oh, he's, you're breaking up again, Adam. Uh, think, we offer okay. a, a, a read comprehension rifle and a go. Yeah. Adam, you're really breaking up. Video and okay, so sorry. Tanya, can you pick it up from here? I'm not sure what. Yes, absolutely. And I'm sorry. What was the question? I still have full bars. Are you, there was a question in the chat um, that, uh, oh, I think you already, did you answer Jean's question in the chat, Tanya? I did, I did. So um, one of the nice things about having uh, the HiSET account, the My HiSET account, is um, you can actually just ask the student to give you a copy of their comprehensive score report. Um, that will give you a, a basically the most up-to-date look at what all their scores are, um, even if they haven't taken all of them. So um, you can ask for that or the individual score report. It's just a PDF they can download or they can email to you. Thank you, Tanya. And I think when Adam was breaking up one thing, and uh, some of you may have heard this and some of you may be new to this, um, on the writing test, what Adam and I were talking about at one point was on the writing test, students will not be able to pass the writing test without writing an essay. That's um, correct. That is correct. So that is a change back to what some of us were used to in the previous GED test. And, and um, so, um, so that may have impact on our instruction um, as we, um, if we've kind of gotten away a little bit from really focusing on some of those reasoning skills and writing about evidence, incorporating evidence quotes, um, we're definitely going to need to, to bulk that up again for those of us who've kind of gotten a little away from that. Yeah, this might be a good time for us to talk about um, other webinars that we are going to be planning. Um, so we are definitely, um, we have a series that delves more into um, you know, writing, reading, and math in particular. Um, Adam's looking forward to doing those. It's one of his, his favorite series of workshops to do. Um, and that just really kind of digs deeper, not only into the resources that we have about the subtests themselves, but also um, a better understanding of how you can help your students understand what the questions are asking and how best to answer them or how best for you to even um, help them understand those questions. So look for those um, webinars where uh, we'll be scheduling those sometime over the next few months. Great. Uh, I want to keep us to, oh, Adam, I was going to say, I want to keep us to time. Did you? Oh, oh you're still I just want to say now. real briefly that we have a webinar series. Okay. Sorry. Yep, Adam, you're 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 breaking up. Um, I do want to encourage you to reach out. Thank you so much for um, for sharing your emails, Tanya and Adam. We'll be seeing more of Tanya and Adam um, as we talk about uh, the PD. They've talked to me about some of these great um, webinars, uh, the series that they do, and we'll be looking at that. And Atlas, of course, will be looking at um, at how we can further support as we go along. Um, we will be posting things on the Atlas website. Um, thank you so much. Um, this is exciting. Options are exciting. Um, and I know that as we go on, there'll be so many more questions. Minnesota ABE, we are known nationwide for asking lots of questions. And I personally am very proud of that. So um, we, will, we will put your knowledge to the test. Uh, one thing I do want to quickly say is in the chat box, um, I am just posting it now. We are going on to our lunch break. And the next session will begin at one and there's a link to the flyer and that's it. Tanya, Adam, if you have anything else, I just wanted to make sure that I did my hosting duties. <laughs> I think that covered it. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much. Cool. Have a great lunch, everybody. Bye-bye. Yes, those are great questions in the chat. Yeah, they yeah. are. They were. This is good, good, good. It shows engagement. That's what I like. Thank you so, so much. Um, anyone here have a question or I, I will close out this session? Christy, Sarah, Judy, Jill? Nice picture, Christy. I like that look. <laughs> <laughs> I. <laughs> if you if you met Christy, you would totally get it like that it captures her.
<laughs> her wonderful personality. Um, I think people may have run off to lunch without even yeah. closing out of their session. Thank you so much. We look forward to working with you both and we certainly will be. Thanks so much. Right. Thank Talk you. Have you a great Bye -bye. Thursday. You too. Bye-bye.